Важлива будь-яка інформація стосовно місця знаходження колишніх службовців Беркуту. Підозрюваних у причетності до вбивства захисників Майдану. Лише разом ми здолаємо беззаконня. Це питання гідності всього українського народу та кожного окремо. Будь ласка, уважно подивіться на ці обличчя. Якщо ви когось із них пізнаєте, негайно телефонуйте за номером. 21 людина, всі подались на, на отримання російського громадянства, тобто вони всі в Росії. Він казав, що в тренері їх вивіз, щоб їх не посадили в тюрму. Висловлюю щиро подяку тим робітникам правоохоронних органів, які три місяці терпіли, страждали. А він дзвонив і, це, і говорив, що я нікого не боюся і все, я нічого не винен. Відмовляємо їх. Проведені через загрозу національній безпеці Російської Федерації. Щодо колег ваших, які от такі до Росії, на вашу думку, чому це сталося? Ось ви можна? По дійствиям цього мужика, якого зараз підставляють під Павліка, це навіть не сержант. Те, що я знаю, я вам це казати не буду. Там ще є, ще десь є, що це хлопці, чого я буду це, це буду розказувати. Тому що в них є того, то вже є сім'ї. This was one of the most tragic episodes of the Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity. It happened on February 20th, 2014, on Kyiv city centre's Institutska street. Officers dressed in black targeted activists. 48 people died on that day and 80 people were injured. Among the dead were four law enforcement officers. These are the Special Forces officers, or the so-called Black Company of the Berkut Riot Police. 26 of them were declared suspects in the shootings of the activists by the prosecutor's office. They were headed by Dmitro Sadovnik, who was detained in August 2014, but later released under house arrest. Sadovnik pleaded innocence and fled to Russia. We became unwitting hostages in this situation, and we really did understand. We were aware of what was happening, but we fulfilled our duties, and now we continue to stand in line. According to the prosecutor's office, Dmitro Sadovnik received Russian citizenship and now works in Simferopol, annexed Crimea. But what happened to the rest of the riot police? Five of them are in the docks. Twenty managed to escape at the end of February 2014. Sixteen of them are in Russian territory and the other four are in annexed Crimea. Russia refuses to hand them over to the Ukrainian prosecutor's office. Even our request to investigate the Berkut officers and other individuals was denied because we asked to hand out charge papers and question them on the events of the crimes committed. This is the grave of Ruslan Horbik, who served in Kyiv's Berkut riot police and, according to the prosecutor's office, was on Institutska Street on the day of the shootings. In late February 2014, shortly after the events on Maidan, he left Ukraine. However, he died four years later in February 2018. He is buried in his home village, Luchinets, in Ukraine's Vinnytsia region. His body was delivered to his parents via the Russian border in Kharkiv. No one told us anything, where he was, what he was doing. They said he was killed, and that was it. Some guys called us to come and pick up the body. Who called? Someone from Russia? We don't know. These guys who were there with him. Most of the former Berkut officers who fled to Russia tried getting jobs in the Russian law enforcement. Ruslan's mother says that her son also ended up in the Russian police force. I don't know when he got out of Ukraine. I won't tell you because I don't know. I only found out when they told my son was on the television. A relative told me. He ran and said, I am not afraid of anyone. I am not guilty of anything. But when he left Ukraine, did you know that he was in Russia? He was in Russia. He said that he had completed a massage course, he was working as a masseur, and then he went into the police. Artur Matiek, Horbik's school friend, last spoke with him towards the end of 2014. Back then, Horbik stated that he'd been helped out of the country by a Berkut trainer. He told me that their trainer had taken them to Russia, so that they didn't end up in prison as far as I understand. There were six or seven like them left. 
who did not have any protection. Maybe it was for financial reasons, so that they could get away with it. But he told me that he did not take part in the Maidan shootings. The investigation has established that among those who helped the Berkut flee was the head of the No One But Us organization, Alexander Kovalev, and former Interior Ministry employee, Serhii Yakovenko. The former was declared a suspect, but the investigation was later put on hold. Yakovenko has been on the wanted list since January last year. So what happened to Hodbik in Russia? The Prosecutor General's office received information from residents of the Vinnytsia region that the former Berko officer could have died in Syria during an operation with the Wagner Private Military Company. Mercenaries from this company have been linked to the war in Donbass and, most recently, with the war in Syria. Holbik's relatives say they do not know anything about him serving as a mercenary. Do you know anything about him fighting in Syria? No. Where did that come from? I haven't even heard of that name Wagner before. Pramadsky managed to get hold of Horbik's death certificate. According to this document, Horbik died in February 2018 in the Chechen capital Grozny, in unknown circumstances. Was he patriotic? Of course, I think there's a reason people join the army. They join to defend Ukraine. And when you found out that he's in Russia, how did you react? There's a war in the country and he's in Russia. On the one hand, it was good that he was alive, but on the other, he sold out his homeland. It was about 286 meters from the concrete barricade, from the place the prosecutor's office showed. Two fighter guys changed their magazine. There's a 30-meter fence around the minister's club and 150 meters of green space. Not only could they not see the target, they couldn't even see the October Palace. But the prosecutor's office argued that the bullet went from right to left, from top to bottom, on the right-hand side. The father of Pavlo Abroskin, one of the five former riot police officers on trial for the Maidan shootings, is certain that it is not the officers who fired first. And he does not recognize his son in the videos presented by the prosecution. That's not Pavlo. I'm his father, I know. Even by the actions of this man, who they are passing off as Pavlo, he's not even a sergeant. If you watch the video, he is given commands. A surgeon who has served for one and a half years cannot give commands. So who gave the orders to the officers? The investigation has accused a criminal organization headed by ex-President Yanukovych of the shootings and other crimes against activists. This also includes former Interior Minister Vitaly Zaharchenko and other officials. At present, it is not possible to complete the pre-trial investigation against Yanukovych without making changes to legislation. And the parliament is refusing to consider these changes. In 2016, Yanukovych was questioned as a witness in the case regarding the shootings. He stated that he was not involved in organizing the shootings on Maidan and expressed his gratitude to the Berkut. The court hearings for the Maidan shootings happen almost every week. The court has now heard the victims' testimonies and will soon hear those of the witnesses. This could take almost another year. The hearings usually take place on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But despite the huge public response, not many people attend. Pavlo Obroskin's father is always there. He travels from Nizhyn, Chernihiv region, by train and returns home after the hearings. However, an investigative experiment is still underway on Institutska Street. It is currently impossible to carry out an investigative experiment normally, in that between January 24th and 26th, a fence was put up. Temporary structures were put up at the top of Institutska Street, porter cabins, and in fact, it prevented the investigative experiment from being carried out. And this is despite the fact that according to a court decision, an important plot of land was seized at the request of the Prosecutor General's office in order to prevent any changes to the situation, to prevent any distortion. This important plot of land is evidence and evidence is located there. They seem to be in a hurry to build a memorial to the Heavenly Hundred on Institutska Street. 
Prosecutor General Yuri Lutsenko has announced that the investigative experiment is complete, although this is not the case. The street is de facto under arrest. Any changes to the landscape, felling of trees or repairs to the pavements could hinder the investigator's ability to establish the trajectory measurements of the bullets and therefore prevent them from establishing the truth. These investigative experiments look at a realistic sector of the site of the events. And all these made-up stories about snipers in the Ukraine hotel, or the fact that the shootings were carried out on both sides, or about these Georgians, Lithuanians, or snipers from wherever else, all these infinite other stories you can come up with, they're going to become easier to make up the longer it takes. If the terrain changes, it will be difficult to refute the stories later. Everything that we manage to do now, to record and record correctly, in a procedural manner, secure it, so that it can be used in the future as procedural evidence and as an element of the story, that is what we will have. And everything that we won't be able to do, because of the fence, the reconstruction, the construction of something that's at the hands of somebody, all that will be lost forever.